<laughs> you just activated this trap video. The setup for this video was that thumbnail and title I got you, and I gave you a warning sign that had a trap in the title and in the thumbnail, but you still clicked on it, which was the trigger. The trigger was you clicking on the video, which the effect was this video, and the only counter to this would be would be clicking off the video. But don't do that, don't do that, because the final part are the tweaks and all the different tweaks and changes you can make to traps to build your own custom trap, because that's what we're going over here in this video that you just triggered and trapped yourself into watching. You see what I did there? I, I took the real life and turned it into this system, because the things I just went through are these steps in my Dungeon Coach approved build a trap system to build your own trap for any and everything that's in your own game that you can build right now. You guys like my video on the guy of how to run traps and now this video is going over how to make them yourself from initial thought to the final completion and lots of different tweaks you can make to be able to put them into your game you're running right now or potential games in the future and this is perfect because we're in the month of february which is something i'm starting here that i'm going to do every year now is february is going to be a month of home brews for you guys we're doing traps right now next is going to be city builder and how to build your own city then we're doing monsters i mean what else is there to homebrew besides monsters cities and traps but if you want to homebrew your entire world and your entire game system that's alcanor's almanac which is that's a that's a whole other thing but now let's dive into homebrewing some traps with this simple five step system the first system is the setup you're going to set up this is a lot of times flavor text to be able to give yourself as a dungeon master because you might not remember exactly how the trap where you have to in it's been a while since you made the trap last, which happens to me a lot, is I'll make a trap and then months later they actually encounter it in some way. So I'm like, oh, I have to like scan through it. Flavor text in the beginning here during the setup portion of this trap creation is going to help you a lot because you can just read off the thing and that's what they see. And then just reading that gives them time to kind of process it and start interacting with it and start doing stuff. And that gives you a little window to then read the rest of it and, and be caught up so you're not slowing things down. But to create this flavor text for yourself, you want to be able to describe from the player's perspective what they would see with this trap. Like what kind of things are, is there to interact with? And at, at first you might not know the exact workings of this trap. But hopefully if you watched that last video and you got your head thinking about the players and the world and who's made this trap and all the type of stuff setting up this thing, you'll have some sort of idea of where this is going to be put. Because also what goes into this step are those warning signs those little clues and heads up that there may or may not be a trap here and you can raise and lower this to be as obvious or as not obvious as you want and a lot of times the trap dc comes in here there's a dc that you should set for how hard it is to be able to find this trap much less how much damage it does and all that kind of stuff you can figure out that later how hard is it to find this thing now here's a quick chart for you this little chart right here is kind of where i gives me a little reference point of how difficult i want this thing to be it has a flat dc and then i add the proficiency bonus to it and it helps me match the difficulty of this trap to how hard it would be to find uh, with the players. This DC can be used to find the trap, to be able to dismantle the trap or the tra the actual trap effect, the save DC that it would take to resist the damage from the trap or whatever other effects you have going on. In general, I like to have my DC be the same for all of those levels, but you can always change it and tweak it from there. So a big step back here, something I preach in every type of thing that I homebrew, this is not a linear process and the city builder and the monster builder all this stuff that i'm going to be sharing with you guys i don't create these in a single file line every single time coming up with this thing then this thing every single always you it's going to be a flow fluid process whenever you're doing this thing i might not know what the players might see because i might not really have a good vision for what this trap is yet so i might skip step number one of the setup and warning signs and flavor text because i might not be able to write that yet or maybe i do start with that and i know what i want them to kind of see in this vine covered temple oh it's a vine covered temple now i know that the trigger to this trap would be touching one of the vines or cutting one of the vines maybe the vines are alive you see what i'm saying all this stuff kind of connects with each other and i just accidentally created a trap based on one of these steps which all bleed in and link to each other which leads me into step number two is the trigger for this trap how does this trigger work what sets it off what type of things that the players have to do how obvious is it that this trap triggers is as soon as they trigger it is there a delay or does it happen immediately maybe it's specific actions that they do or items that they have they're holding a certain magic item and if that magic item gets close enough something happens maybe it's weight of a certain amount of weight being placed onto a certain location or maybe it's bodies and it can this trap of some kind can sense the souls of creatures around it and as soon as there's a certain number it triggers and maybe that number that 
you choose as a dungeon master is two less than your party's total. So if you have five players, maybe it just takes three and the trap triggers sealing and separating the party in two. I'm out. I've set another trap for you and this is me setting it up and giving you a warning sign for it. <laughs> See how this is all playing together? The trigger for this trap is down in the description and it's a link to my Patreon or my website if you're watching this video in the future because I have this entire resource that we're kind of going over right here that goes to even more depth on how to build your own trap. Tons of charts and tables and resources to be able to pick and choose from to make any trap for any situation. Because I'm gonna do the best job I can in this video to talk about and explain how I make traps to you guys, but a lot of times the best thing to do is just have something in front of you that leads you through it step by step. So this month's DC Playbook Volume 6 is all about traps. It has this entire step-by-step -step build a trap resource in it. That's what I try and do in a lot of my DC Playbooks is give you homebrew build a systems. The last month was a build a dragon system. And if you joined during the month of February, you get both of those for the price of one. It's available to my patrons until the end of March, and then it's available on my website after that. It really does help me do what I can here on this channel to keep making more and more resources like this for you guys, bringing in artists to be able to draw and make really cool looking traps, bringing in a bunch of people on the team to be able to come up with a bunch of traps. And I hope this resource and this video help you make traps because that is one of the struggles that I had as a dungeon master of how do I make traps? And it's just, it's something that I hear so many people struggle with. So I'm so excited to be able to give you guys this resource. But now back to the trap. Step number three, and this might be the biggest one of the whole thing is the effect. What happens once this trap is eventually triggered, unless they can counter it, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. What happens? How many people does it affect? Is it an immediate effect that happens right now or is there some sort of delayed effect and then there's a rumbling and then something starts to there's an earthquake things start to collapse is it an area of effect does it affect more players or just the player that triggered it does this trap have a lasting effect that lasts over multiple rounds maybe it affects a status condition or some sort of burning damage condition to a player that lasts over time and then can it recharge and do it again or is it a one-time use and then it's gone since the effect of this trap is pretty much the biggest thing about it and the central core of what this trap does when it gets triggered i'm going to go through this list here that i have from the dc playbook volume 6 trap resource and give you guys some little sparks of inspiration because we got pinning traps traps that pin you to the ground and then you're trying that's the whole point is it stops you and immobilizes you in some way there's an unstable ceiling the stuff starts to fall down on you attacking something is like shooting projectiles at you or maybe it releases creatures even where creatures enter the room because you triggered the trap that's always a possibility which then leads to combat Ooh, that's all connecting right uh, a dead end maybe there's some sort of wall that blocks off passage and you now can't go any farther from where you needed to go from or seals you in to the room for then all all these effects can also combine and overlap too you know what i'm saying it's where maybe it cuts off the walls and then the ceiling starts to slowly drop that's a trap right there uh then you have falling where yourself gets whoop and you drop out from underneath it and you fall into maybe a container of some kind to be captured and kept in one certain spot you see how all this is kind of blurring together uh poison different conditions maybe that's the effect is it affects a condition on you that now you have to have on you for the whole dungeon maybe your dungeon has a certain type of effect a lingering uh, poison that's causes and as you get more and more stacks of this thing maybe it's exhaustion or some other homebrew mechanic you have maybe you start to go crazy whatever this effect is maybe that's the whole effect of this trap and then you have different other things like blinding or smoke and it causes to fill the room because you failed or triggered this trap or maybe the effect is the alert thing that i keep forgetting about every time i start talking about these traps i forget about the warning alarm alert but a lot of these questions can be answered if you think about the stuff I talked about in last video. What's the purpose of this trap? What's its goal being here? Why are you choosing as the human dungeon master that is creating this game? Why are you choosing this trap to be here? What do you want it to do? And then that informs so many of your decisions from there. Maybe you do want to trap the players in one spot and then monsters come in. Maybe as the monsters are running in, the ceiling's collapsing. You don't throw too much and don't stack these too many ways because then it's just going to be a, a chaos. But uh, overlap these things in the ways that you want for the thing that makes sense for where you're putting this trap. Step four now are counters. How are your players going to stop this trap? I talked about it a lot in last video, and that's why this really is a package deal with these 
two videos together is how are the players going to stop it? What is the possibilities for them to stop it? There should be multiple ways to stop it for the record. I usually would not have it be only one thing, have options there, have different parts for it to be interacted with different things, different moving pieces that the players can try and mess with. And then once they finally get a roll that's high enough, there we go. But if there is only one way to solve this trap, then it better be a clear way of how to solve this trap, or that's going to be real rough if your players end up teaching PK and dying because they didn't figure out your one thing. Here are two things that I ask myself as a dungeon master in this trap creation process once I get to step four. Sometimes I might think of the counter and then backwards create it from there, but that's a little bit more rare. So this usually is one of the later steps of this process. I think of two things. How much do I want the dice to play into this picture? How much do I want the roles of the counters to do? Maybe they just say that they do something and that is the counter and then it happens. As soon as there's these moving gears and I want to stick something in between I stick this very this metal rod or the movable rod into the thing and press the button and it stops it you just thwarted the trap you just countered it good job that's an awesome idea because it would feel real bad if they came up with this awesome idea I asked them for a dexterity check to place the rod in the right spot at the right time where the gears are turning and they roll a, t a two and now they don't, and now they're still stuck, and now that puts you in that situation where we've all been in before, where there's some sort of door, or there's some sort of obstacle, and everybody keeps rolling really low, and this wasn't what you intended for, and then this happens. So keep in mind the DC that you set of how hard this is and what your players are saying that they do, because you want the dice to play as big of a role as you want it to play. So don't let the dice run away with the thing and ha always be asking for rolls. You're the dungeon master, make sure you keep control of that. The second thing I think about is what would I do if I was them, how would I solve this trap? How would I dismantle it? So once a lot of times, I'd probably say most times, I create this trap and I have this idea. Okay, cool. How can they stop it now? And then I literally <laughs> role play in my head, my own players. And I think of the players and the characters. I think of both of them. What would I do as these characters? What do they have at their disposal? I talked about that in the last video. What are their capabilities? What do they have? What tools do they have to be able to use in this type of situation? Okay, cool. And as long as I can come up with some ideas, I feel pretty good. And then I also think about my players. What do they tend to do? What would, what would Jimmy at the table probably do with his barbarian? Okay, he's probably going to smash into something. Thinking this just gives me comfort in the fact that I know it is possible to counter this trap or get out of it or whatever the case may be. And this tip also applies to puzzles in some ways of how to solve a puzzle and not having only one solution and thinking of a solution, but it doesn't have to be the solution because when your players start playing, I know at least I feel comfort in this is possible to counter this trap. Okay, great. But if the players come up with a, a, a lateral move or some sort of other option, I want to run with that. And that's super cool because with all the possibilities of options, that leads us right into step five, which are the tweaks. What if they do get stuck? What if they do come up with these alternate solutions that might change the exit path of where they would go? What's the worst case scenario? What crazy things might happen? If they do go and they're supposed to go enter in the trap here and they exits right there, but they come up with some amazing thing in this hole in the wall where light was coming through to do this thing. Maybe they open that up and now they're exiting this way. What do you do? Maybe you immediately redesign the entire layout of the dungeon and now that is the new entrance of where they were already going to be coming out of anyway. And you just move that place of where they were supposed to come out and now it's up here and they enter in and you keep on going like normal. You could totally do that. But maybe, and this is the most beautiful part about this fluid five step system, is maybe just having that thought makes you create and something different in the dungeon. Maybe there's a new path now of, oh my gosh, maybe that's like a secret. And now they're in the layer of the dragon of this layer that they're trying to navigate through. And that trap led them into a shortcut and now they're here. Or maybe it's not the dragon's layer. Maybe it's the treasure hoard of the dragon. And now they have these advantages and different things at their disposal that they wouldn't have had before. But you would have never known to have that thought or never had the opportunity to have this cool tweak creation if you didn't think about this moment and try and shake up and challenge the the puzzle or trap that you're throwing at your players to see what they would possibly do. That process of thinking about what if helps add in tweaks that could be entire new parts of the game to where maybe that's just such a cool idea that now that original plan of the enter in here and they leave here, maybe now as the dungeon master running this off, you purposely give them 
hints and nudges and clues to lead them towards that way. Maybe you really start playing up that beam of light that's coming through and you keep referencing it in your description. Thinking about these tweaks helps to connect this trap deeper into your world to answer these what if questions, because what would the monsters do? It maybe if you bust through that situation and you see the horde, they have a few seconds and now they fight a dragon when they weren't ready to because the world is alive and acting around this trap. As a bonus tip here for the traps damage is in the last video, I talked about a home brew system that is in Alcanor's Almanac. It is in the uh, DC's volume six playbook. Quick recap is the dungeon coach method is you have the party's level is the number of dice that you roll. So a level eight party would have eight dice be rolled. And what dice you roll depends on the severity level of how bad you want this to be. If it's something really small and piddly, okay, D4s. It's just a little inconvenience. I'm, I'm sure Zach will put the chart up in here somewhere. Um, but it's D4s for an inconvenience to be eight D4s. No big deal, really, for a level eight party or you could scale it all the way up to probably not the d12s probably stick with the d10s because that's a little bit crazy but you have the damage severity level for this trap as a little cheat sheet for you but another option a method two here which is the whole spirit of alcanor's almanac the book that should be really mm, it's getting close y'all it's getting so close but another alternate method for traps that i want to share with you guys here is a scaling d6 method this method's also really simple it takes out the variable of the dice this time and they're always d6 you just always, everyone loves D6. You probably got a thousand of them behind your screen. The dice you roll for traps in this method are always a D6. You just have to decide the severity level. Is it a setback? Is it dangerous? Or is it deadly? If it's just a setback, you roll half your party's level in dice. So that level eight group, you would roll four D6 because it's always a D6 and it's just a setback, which is half of the party's level. So that eight gets cut in half down to a four. You roll four, four D6 for that setback get it for a dangerous one though uh oh it's the party's level in dice so that level eight group would have eight d6 rolled for their damage that's pretty dangerous and now if you want to go deadly uh oh you have twice your party's level in dice of d6s so that level eight party would have 16 d6 for a super deadly trap and oh my gosh that's like a dragon breath weapon in some ways that's a pretty deadly trap so if you want to modify that you might want to modify it to be 150 percent and if you're good at adding math that would be 12 because half of eight is four and you add four back to eight, that's 12. That's just a quick little math <laughs> math tip there. But the whole point of these systems is to be a generalized estimate for you to be able to quickly do stuff on the fly and have a ballpark for what you're wanting. So really quick off the, off the cuff here, a level five party with this system would have, okay, half of five, let's round it down, be nice. Two, two D6 for a setback, five D6 for something crazy, and like seven or eight D6 for something deadly. Gives you a good ballpark to tweak and adjust from no matter which of the two methods you do, because hopefully when you're playing around with this stuff, you'll create your own method of what kind of numbers you pull out of your head on the fly to be nice and fair. You know, you know, kill a player or something. But if you do want to kill a player, check out the DC playbook and get all of the resources to kill your players with. <laughs> takes the work off of you yourself but for real uh if you want to check it out uh, all the stuff and links are down in the description for everything we've been talking about here i do love me some traps i really have i've been looking forward to giving you guys this resource and talking about traps since i started like two years ago i was like i had on my list traps and i want to be able to give you guys something to help with traps and here it is finally i wanted to do it right and a lot of work has gone into this trap resource to be able to give you guys something that's truly helpful to your games and making those traps and fixing those moments of like ah, i don't know what ah. so hopefully all of this helps you stay creative and think outside the box peace